Is it record this on Saturday, July 3rd? That means tomorrow is Sunday, July 4th. July 4th, of course, is the day that the USA celebrates as our day of independence or Independence Day. 245 years ago, on July 4th, 1776, the, the Declaration of Independence was signed and the experiment that is the American effort at democracy had its beginning. That initial independence, of course, come at great cost to those involved with it. And over the years, there's been the ups and downs through all of that and, and more blood has been shed to secure the freedoms that we've enjoyed. Uh, there's more work to be done, of course, behind all of that. But freedom, of course, is a very precious thing, political freedom personal freedom, the freedoms that we sadly take for granted far too often. We share another story of freedom that maybe puts some things in perspective. In the Mariners Museum in Newport News, Virginia, there is a special display for a rickety old homemade aluminum kayak. This tiny makeshift boat seems oddly out of place in the midst of displays for impressive Navy vessels and artifacts from significant battles on the sea. But a bronze plaque tells museum visitors the story behind this particular kayak's heroic makers. In 1966, an auto mechanic named Loriano and his wife Consuelo decided that they could no longer live under the oppressive uh, rule of Cuba's totalitarian regime. After spending months collecting bits of scrap metal, they pieced together this boat, just barely big enough for two small people. Then Loriano jury-rigged a small lawnmower engine on the back of the kayak. After, after months of planning and on a moonless, moonlit night, they set out into the treacherous Straits of Florida with only their swimsuits on. They had just enough food and water for two days. Finally, after 70 hours, the U.S. Coast Guard rescued the couple just south of the Florida Keys. You might be asking, was it worth the risk? Loriano said this, when one has grown up in liberty, you realize how important it is to have freedom. We live in the enormous prison, which is Cuba, where one's life is not worth one crumb, where one goes out into the street and does not know whether one will return because of the political police that can arrest you without warning and put you into prison. Before this could happen to us, we thought that going into the ocean and risking death or even being eaten by sharks is a million times better than to stay suffering under political oppression. Obviously, this young couple had a, a dream of freedom that they take, took a great risk to enjoy and credit to them for taking the chances they did. But many others, of course, throughout the world don't enjoy the freedoms that we have. And it's my prayer that we never take for granted the freedoms we have in our country. Freedom is a precious thing. It usually costs very much to have freedom secured. I wanna talk this morning about spiritual freedom, as important as political freedom, personal freedom, all of the various freedoms we enjoy. So as important as those things are, perhaps not as, as, as important as spiritual freedom. It's really the story of the Bible, if you will. You've got at the very beginning of the scriptures, the story of how humanity fell into sin, fell into the clutches of the tempter or our adversary. And the rest of the Bible, of course, records God's efforts at freeing us from that sin, that slavery. So the could be said the Bible is a message of freedom at great personal cost to God. Let's take a look at that freedom this morning as we think about independence. First of all, I would assert that freedom was central to the mis mission of the Messiah, the Son of God. You don't read far into the life and ministry of Jesus before you run across things like Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. 
Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. This is early in the ministry of Jesus, just getting his start at sharing God's message about the kingdom of God. But notice what is said here about his mission and how freedom was so central or vital to everything that Jesus set out to do. Starting in Luke chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, And he, or Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Again, not the purpose of this lesson, but it's want to highlight as well Jesus' efforts at, at uh, fitting into the culture in which he was trying to reach. It was Jesus' practice, apparently, as he was being raised up to uh, go to the synagogue like a faithful Jew would do and, and to hear the scriptures read. So Jesus goes on this particular Sabbath, and uh, he's given an opportunity to read. Verse 17 says, And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it is written. Here's the, what he reads from Isaiah. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then it says he closed the book, gave it or scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and all of the eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And bounce back just a moment to that quote from Isaiah, did you hear the words of freedom associated there with the work of the anointed one or the Messiah? It says, release to the captives, setting free those who were oppressed, even the recovery of sight to the blind, and then the gospel to the poor. Those are all forms, if you will, of, of liberation or independence or freedom. Again, I would affirm the message of freedom, the work of freedom was central to the work of the Messiah. Jesus claims that mantle here in Nazareth, doesn't he? Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, Jesus says in verse 21. So he's willing to say, that's my job. That's part of my task. I'm fulfilling this task of bringing freedom to a world that's enslaved in so many different ways. As a child of God, we enjoy the freedom that the Messiah came to establish. In the rest of the lesson, we want to talk about various facets of that freedom. Again, throughout the New Testament, you find references by the inspired writers back to this freedom that Jesus came to secure. As a child of God, if you are a child of God, we enjoy a freedom that truly is liberating, spiritual freedom. Again, I'm thankful for all the physical freedoms and the political freedoms and the religious freedoms I enjoy as being uh, a citizen of this country. They're all important to me, but none are as important as the type of freedoms we're talking about here today, spiritual freedom. First of all, when we talk about the freedom a Christian enjoys, let's note what we're freed from. What we're freed from. First of all, it's clear in the scriptures that we are free from the law of sin and death. Well, what's the law of sin and death? The soul that sins dies. That was the original problem in the garden. And it's the problem that we've all participated in in one way or another as, as we sin in our lives. Sin brings forth death. That's the law associated with sin and death. It's a powerful thing. It's... It's what separates us from God. We sin and we die spiritually. But notice what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Of course, in the book of Romans, Paul has been highlighting the gospel message of righteousness found through Christ. And notice what he says here. Therefore, there is no now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, sin brings condemnation as well as death. 
But if you're in Christ, there is no condemnation for you. But notice verse 2 says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has done what? Set you free from the law of sin and death. There's only one way out of the law of sin and death. There's only one way to avoid the consequences of that law, stipulations of that law, and that's to be found in Christ on the basis of what he's done. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. It no longer applies to the one who is in Christ. What a great freedom that is. Again, without it, we're hopelessly in chains to this law. If we sin, we die. There's nothing we can do or anyone else can do about it. It's only what God can do, and he did it through Christ. So praise God that we're free from the law of sin and death. Another way of looking at it, though, is what we see in Romans chapter 6, and that's the fact that we're freed from slavery to sin. Not only are we free from the law of sin and death and the consequences it brings, but we're free from the slavery to sin itself. Sin brings death, but there's a slavery that's associated with sin. It's like being drawn into bondage. One sin is never enough, is it? It grows and, and wraps its it's chains around us till it strangles us. In Romans chapter 6, much of that chapter is devoted to this slavery to sin and the blessing found for those in Christ. In fact, I want to read Romans chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. It would be good if you want to read the whole chapter later, but these verses highlight the freedom that is won in Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 and following. Paul again says, therefore, we, speaking of those who have put their faith in Christ, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So again, that's the imagery of baptism. We're baptized with Christ. We're raised to walk in newness of life. Resurrection power, if you will. Verse 5, for if we have been become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Both go together. Knowing this, verse 6, that our old self was crucified with him, that old self steeped in slavery to sin. Why? In order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died spiritually is freed from sin. So we have freedom from slavery to sin, and it's only again through sharing in the resurrection life of Christ by faith. That's how our old self is crucified. Again, it's what baptism uh, simulates. We die and are buried, raised to walk in newness of life. And by virtue of the power of God through Christ, his sacrifice, we are no longer slaves to sin. Those bonds have been forever broken for the, for the child of faith. He who has died is freed from sin. What a great freedom that is. Perhaps before you became a Christian, you reached that point in your life where you understood just how much you were a slave to sin. Try as you might, you couldn't stop doing the things you wanted to, to do. That's really what chapter 7 of Romans is all about. But yet, in Christ, you have the power to do what you couldn't do on your own. You have the power of the one who can bring you true freedom. So we've talked about how we're freed from things. We're free from the law of sin and death. We're free from the slavery to sin. We're also free from salvation based on law keeping. We're free from salvation based on law keeping. That's important. Because one thing we learn, that outside of Christ, we can't live perfectly enough, no matter what kind of law you're talking about. Of course, for the New Testament writers, they were usually contrasting efforts to be made righteous under the law of Moses compared to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, as we just read about. But 
it's really true for any law system. You can't have salvation based on law keeping. It's what Paul brings up in one of his lessons in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13, verses 38 and 39. Notice what Paul says here about salvation based on law keeping. He says, therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, speaking of Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, verse 39, everyone who believes, everyone who has faith is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Okay, or I would affirm any other law system. You cannot be freed from your sins through the law of Moses. The Lat law wasn't designed to do that. The law of Moses was designed to point us to the one through whom we could be freed from sin. So those in Christ enjoy the blessing of freedom from that type of salvation. It's an unreachable salvation. Again, if you're guilty of one sin, you're guilty of them all, the Bible affirms. And that's a slavery that's hard to escape. In fact, there's only way to do it, one way to do it, and that's through Christ. Christ kept the law so that we could be freed from a salvation based on law keeping. Uh, later in Romans chapter 10 and verse 4, Paul says it this way, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You see, there had to come a point when uh, the law system ended and made gave way to the new covenant, covenant and the spirit of life in Christ. That's a freedom that was costly to God. It cost the death of his own son, but God was willing to make that price. He loved us enough to do that. Christ loved us enough to go to the cross and secure the freedom that we could have for salvation that could be found nowhere else. So we enjoy freedom from a lot of things as a Christian. We just talked about three, but let's go on to talk about another facet of freedom. Not only do we enjoy a freedom that is liberating, but we also enjoy a freedom that is limiting. And you might say that sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? How can, how can freedom be limiting? Well, spiritual freedom, I believe, is designed to be that way, and it doesn't take away from the freedom. As a child of God, we enjoy a freedom that is limiting, a freedom with limits. And to hear me out and see if it doesn't make some sense. You see, we are free as Christians to act within the limits set by the desires and directions of God. And that, my friend, is true freedom. Freedom without limits really just leads to anarchy, doesn't it? That's not true freedom as well. Freedom comes, the true freedom comes responsibility. You've heard that said before. Well, it's true in the spiritual realm. We are free to act within the limits set by the desires and directions of God. Let's talk about a few of those limits. First of all, the Bible teaches that we're free as Christians to live righteously. We're free to something not from something. That's later in Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. I said that whole chapter really deals with it. Here's another example. Romans 6, 17 and 18 says, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. So we are freed from sin. But notice verse 18, Paul says, And having been freed from sin, you became what? slaves of righteousness so there's a sense in which we traded servanthood we traded slavery we became slaves of righteousness we became servants of god that's a limitation if you will we're free to live righteously slaves of righteousness and that's a true freedom it's not a it's not a limitation in the sense that well we're not truly free we are but we're free to live as God calls us to live. And the only way that happens is in Christ. Number two, we're also free to treat others well. We are free to treat others well. I see that in places like Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. Galatians 5, 13. The whole first part of 
Galatians. In fact, really up to chapter 5, verse 12, Paul is dealing with uh, teaching about the freedom in Christ as compared to those who are trying to bind the law on those early Christians. But then he switches gears a bit here in Galatians 5.13, and notice what he says. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. See, once again, as I said a moment ago, spiritual freedom in Christ is not the freedom to just do as we please. That means there's a limit on it. It's what God desires. Yes, we're free, but we can't, or we shouldn't rather, turn that freedom into an opportunity to abuse other people. We're free to treat others well. Here, Paul characterizes it as serving one another in a loving way. And there's countless other things you can see in Scripture about forgiving others and bearing other, one another's burdens and on and on the list goes. We're free in Christ to live in those kind of ways that benefit other people just as Christ ex exemplified for us. So we're free to, to live righteously. We're free to treat others well. We are also free, number three, to avoid sin. We're free to avoid sin. Think about that for a moment. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, Paul tells his young Christian mentor or mentee, he says to Timothy, do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. And then he ends the verse by saying, keep yourself free from sin. That's a big responsibility, isn't it? Keep yourselves free from sin. God will help us, but that's a choice we make. And it's only through the freedom we have in Christ that we're able to do and speak in ways that help us to uh, avoid sin in our life. Without Christ, we're doomed to eventually participate. And yet even in Christ, we'll, we commit sin, but we're covered by the blood of Christ. And we can avoid sin by the power of Christ. We are free to do that in Christ. Finally, another thing we're free to do is we're free in Christ to serve God. First Peter chapter 2, verses 6, verse 16. First Peter 2, 16. The apostle Peter there says, act as free men or women, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves or servants of God. So again, the freedom one in Christ allows us to serve God in the way he calls us to serve. Don't use our freedom as a covering for evil. We're not free to do that. We're free to do it in the sense we can choose to do that. But if we truly love God, there's that limit for the one who says, I want to do what God calls me to do. We're free to serve God. We don't have the chains anymore of sin and darkness holding us back from willingly serving God as we desire to do. Praise God for the fact that we're freed to certain things as well as from certain things. I want to look at one more section of scripture before we stop today, and that's in John chapter 8. John chapter 8. In context here in John 8, Jesus is in a verbal discussion with uh, those that were opposing him, as happened so often in the scriptures. Jesus would teach the truth, and those that weren't ready for the truth objected to what he said, threw up roadblocks in his way, and ultimately crucified him over it. But in the midst of this discussion in John 8, notice what is said in verses 31 through 36. John 8, 31 and following says, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So the topic here is freedom, isn't it? Jesus is speaking to those who have faith in him that, you know, you, you need to stay in me, continue in my word, that will make you true disciples, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But his detractors get wind of, of that, 
and some in the crowd answering this way says they answered him we are abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone how is it that you say you will become free so you see the problem don't you jesus talked about freedom to some people who think they don't need it jesus tells them in verse 34 Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. That's what makes you a slave of sin, is participating in it. And it's something everyone will eventually do. They thought they were free, and Jesus says, you really aren't. You're a sinner. The slave, verse 35, Jesus says, does not remain, or does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. In this last verse, and Verse 36 is powerful. Jesus says, so if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Free indeed. That's true freedom. The freedom we have in Christ is true freedom. There are false freedoms out there. In fact, some of Jesus' listeners had convinced themselves they truly were free, but they really weren't, were they? Were Abraham's descendants and ever yet been enslaved to anyone? How is it that you say you will become free? Those are the words of someone who thought, we're already free. We don't need what you're offering. But Jesus goes on. He says, if you've committed sin, you're a slave of sin. You need the freedom that is offered through the Son of God. It's on the basis of this text. I would just encourage you to choose your freedoms carefully. Choose your freedoms carefully. Everything that presents itself as freedom, especially in the spiritual realm, isn't true freedom. There are some freedoms, false freedoms out there proclaimed spiritually that just lead you into more bondage. I would encourage you to find the freedom that, again, as Jesus emphasizes here in verse 36, that it's found through the Son of Christ, through the Son of God, rather. That's true freedom. That's where you will be free indeed if the Son makes you free talked about several of those freedoms today. Let me just recap them. If we are a child of God, we're free from the law of sin and death. We're free from slavery to sin. We're free from salvation to law keeping. Praise God for all those things we're free from. But as part of that, we also have learned that we're free to do some things. Freedom from all of those things allows us the freedom to live righteously as God has called us to do. We're free to treat others well, to avoid sin, and to serve God. So in that sense, there are limits. We're, we're limited to serving in those ways that God wants to serve if we love him and follow what he says. So choose your freedoms carefully. I would invite all of you who are listening, especially if you're not a child of God, to consider true spiritual freedom. And I would affirm, as Jesus affirms, that it's only found in Christ. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you want true freedom spiritually, if you, if you, struggle, if you struggle with the sin in your life and, and have realized you can't be freed from it on your own efforts, then turn to Christ. Put your faith in him. Repent of a life of rebellion against God. Confess the name of Jesus and, and, and acknowledge your faith in him. Be immersed in water. For the forgiveness of your sins, reenact that death, bell, and resurrection that Jesus or Paul talked about in Romans 6 there. Raised to newness of life and then live in the freedom that has been bought for you at a terrible price through the blood of Christ. Let me encourage you to consider that in your life. God bless. And praise God not only this weekend for the freedoms you enjoy as a citizen of this country, but even more so praise God for the freedoms that you have as part of his spiritual kingdom as we look for the better country that Abraham searched for as well as the Hebrew writer tells us. God bless and have a great week.